بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین الرحمن الرحیم مالک یوم الدین السلام علیکم برادرز و سسترز Today we are going to look at a very important topic of arrival and destination. Arrivals and destination. We've all arrived at a place and we've all left to go to some place. Maybe in the morning when you left for school, or maybe in the morning as you went off to work or to the job that you do. We all know about arriving and departing. But the arrival and destination is sometimes a fun event and can be very exciting. For example, if I go on holiday to say a place like Christmas Island or I go to India or America or Britain it's very exciting to go to a new country but there's the unsavory feeling that when you get to the airport there's going to be a lot of red tape that you're going to have to go through you're going to have to have visas you're going to have to have your passport checked you're going to have to be asked questions and why you're going away how long you intend to stay who you're going to be staying with what's the name of the hotel or the dress that you're going to be staying. It almost seems like there are restrictions to you having fun when you go on holiday. And we all know about arrivals and departures. Now, every human being on earth is on a journey. We are all going somewhere. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, will I arrive at that destination? You know, when I came from South Africa, I had to leave the South African border and I had to present my passport and they made sure that all my paperwork was in place. They wanted to know that my visa was correct. They wanted to know that I had submitted two photographs of who I was to the embassy so that they could keep it on their files. They even wanted to know how what my medical condition was, whether I was sick, whether I was feeling faint, whether I had flu because of things like the H1N1 virus. And so sometimes we have to produce information that really isn't that nice before we can go on holiday. And in life, it's the same. Sometimes we have to produce information about ourselves, expose ourselves, say things about ourselves that we really don't want to admit to ourselves. You know, we are all creatures of weakness. Even the strongest of us is weak. There's a story that I once heard, and I would like to share it with you today. And it's a bit of a long story, but I'm sure you will understand why I'm telling you the story, because it'll help you understand arrival and departure well. There was a king of a land who was very, very wealthy. He was a good Muslim. He prayed five times a day. He gave zakat. He went on hajj. He fasted during the month of Ramadan. He was a good Muslim. He believed in that there is only one God. He said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, many, many times a day. And he didn't just say it with his mouth. He said it with his actions, his thoughts, his deeds. Every part of him believed in what he was saying. When he took the shahada, he knew what he was doing. He continued to take the shahada every single day to make sure that it was in every part of his body. But this king was loved by his people. In fact, he was so respected that everybody was terrified of the day that this king would one day no longer be king. And he was getting old now. He was in his old age and he wanted to retire and he was tired of the political life. And he had been such a loyal, fantastic servant that the people, they used to celebrate every year for his birthday. And they would spend millions of rands, millions of dollars, millions of rupees on his birthday celebration. And every year he would be humble enough and say, no, you guys mustn't waste this money. You should rather give it to the poor. You should rather give it to the sick or the needy. And this man was such a faithful servant of Allah. In fact, all over the city, he had said to people that they need to spend time thinking about their creator. He didn't force people. He didn't say, this everybody in my country, because I'm a Muslim, you all have to be Muslim. He allowed people the choice to make their own choices. Now, there were many things wrong with this city. There were bars and there were clubs and there were women running around half naked. There were men running around half naked. There was lots of bad things going on in the city. But he tried to change the people one person at a time. But there was a big problem for this king. One, he was getting old. And two, he had a son who was very, very badly behaved. This son never listened to anything. The son never prayed five times a day. He never went inside the mosque. He never uh, fasted during the month of Ramadan. He had hardly even opened the Quran in his life. This boy was a bad boy. You know, sometimes you see the stickers, bad boy. This was a real bad boy. And he didn't want to listen to anybody. He wouldn't listen to what his father said. He didn't want to listen to anything. All he wanted to do was go clubbing and partying and having fun. All he wanted was to enjoy the pleasures of life. 
He had every Bollywood movie you could imagine at home. He had every Hollywood movie that you can imagine at home. His CD collection of all the music was so big that when you walked into the room, there wasn't even place for anything else but CDs. He had every DVD that you can, all the gimmicks, all the toys, all the latest cell phones, all the best computers. He had it all. He lived his life up. Friday nights, he would be out first thing on Friday night. 10 o'clock at night, he would be drunk. He would be full of all the toxins that he could get into his body. And he was loving life. He thought this was the greatest thing that he could ever do. Now, he had the father who was this good, solid, strong man. And here you had the son who just wanted to do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. And so the father had this big predicament. What must he do? What can he do to get his son to change? What would convince his child to change? And so he asked his child to come forward the one day. And he said, son, please, for the sake of the kingdom, for our kingdom here, change your ways. Stop doing these things that you're doing. Just for once, just try. And the son said, hey, man, I'm having fun. This is cool, man. Our life is cool. Why must I sit with all these regulations and rules? I'm just enjoying myself. You're an old man. You just worry about yourself. And so the son went off and he did his own thing again and again. And eventually the king got together all his wise men in this village, all the elders and all the officials in this kingdom. And he said, what can we do? And they discussed and they said, well, maybe you should give him ultimatum. Say to him, well, if you don't come right, then you're going to not be able to be um, king one day. And so the king thought, well, this is a good idea. And he went to his son and he said, if you do not come right, you are not going to be heir of the throne. Someone else will take the throne. And so the son said, well, I don't care. It doesn't worry me. I never wanted to be king anyway. And so nothing seemed to get through to him. He was hard as anything. Nothing seemed to get through to him. You know, some people, we get in life, they're really hard. You just can't seem to get through to them. Nothing will sink into them. And so it went on and on like this. And, and so the father was crying and he was upset and he was sad because he loved the son so much. And he loved his people so much. And he felt that he wasn't only failing his country, he was also failing his son. And so uh, one of his advisors came to him and he said, I have one last idea, but you're not going to like this idea. So the father listened to the idea of the advisor and he agreed that this was the best idea. This was the only thing that would possibly work that would make him think that he needs to change his life. And so what he did is he called the son in the morning and he said to the son, you need to be in front of the room where the king had his meetings at 7 o'clock in the morning sharp. And so the son said, oh, well, I'll get there if I want to. If I've got time, I'll be there. But, you know, I've got stuff to do. And the father said, you will be there at 7 o'clock sharp. So 7 o'clock in the morning, as the king's son came wandering through to the courtroom, he came through to the courtroom where the king's chair was and where all the important people were sitting. And he came there half drunk still. He was still hanging over and he said, oh, can't we switch the lights off? It's too dark in here. I can't see properly. You know, I really don't want to do this. It's 7 o'clock in the morning. Can't we change this for like maybe 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning? I'm a bit busy at the moment. And so the king said, no, you have to come now. And so the son moved towards this table in the front of where the king was sitting on his throne. And before him, there was a table very similar to what we have here right now. And on the table, there was a piece of paper. And on that paper, there was a map drawn. And he said, I want you to study this map. And I want you to look at that map very carefully. So the son looked at the map and he said, oh, I know this, I know that place. Yeah, I'll, be, I'll go drinking there. I've got a girlfriend who works there. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is the guy I buy drugs from. Oh, yeah, I know this place. And he pointed at all the places that he knew. So the father said, have you studied the map? He said, yes, I know the way. He said, you see where it's marked on that map? I want you to memorize it. And so he memorized it, and then the father took the map away, and he burnt the map. So the son thought, like, these guys are crazy. What was my father up to? And afterwards, he saw two men coming behind the son, and they both had two huge swords, big, massive swords. You think of these big Arabian swords. And they held them up in the air. And now the son really got worried. He thought, now oh, what's going on? And these two guards stood behind him, these two big men stand behind him with these swords. And then the king pulled back a cloth. And under this cloth was a shell, very similar to the one that you see here, like a shell like this. And inside the shell, there was oil. Oil was full to the top of the shell. And he said to the son, I want you to pick up that shell now. And if you drop one drop of oil out of that shell, these two men that are behind you have got orders to chop your head off immediately. So the son got very worried. So now, what's happening here? What happened to the casual, relaxed father who allows me to do everything I want? He said, if you drop one drop of oil out of that shell, 
they will chop your head off immediately. No jokes. This is me serious. And so the son picked up the shell and he held it and it was quite heavy. And the father said, do you remember that map that you just studied so well? You're going to follow that map. If you're not back along the demarcated route that was given to you on that map, by the time the sun goes down, they've got exactly the same order. They need to chop your head off immediately. Now the son was very worried. And the father said, get going. And he realized the father was serious. Everyone in the kingdom was amazed that the father could be so strict. But the father loved the son and he thought this is the only way to make him wake up. Only way to get him to realize that he needs to make a change. And so the son started on his journey and he picked up the shell, he had the shell behind his hand. He was shaking a little bit and you could see the quivers going across the top of the oil and top of the shell. And he started walking with his big heavy shell through the street. And as he went out through the streets, he went past the first place that he used to hang out, the place that he used to go. And all his friends were screaming and shouting at him and calling out his name. Say, hey, come party with us, come party with us. And all he could do was hold on the shell and think about not dropping a single drop of this oil. All he could think about is the two men behind him with their swords drawn. And he continued to walk past them. He didn't even smell the alcohol coming out of the pub or the clubs that he walked past. He didn't even smell the alcohol. He didn't even see the girls that were half naked standing and calling his name. He didn't even see the people that were throwing money towards him and saying to him, come, 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 let's go and have a party, let's enjoy ourselves. He didn't notice anything. All he was worried about was the shell with his oil in and he was carrying it nervously, making sure that he didn't drop a single drop of oil. And he carried on throughout the city. As he went through the city, he saw the sun coming down and he was sweating. There was just sweat all over him. His clothes were wet. He was terrified. And as he got further and further through the streets, he got more and more afraid that he wasn't going to make it back in time. And as the sun came down, he became more and more afraid. Now we're going to take a short break and I'm going to continue the story when we get back. Welcome back. Now we continue with our story of the rebellious son. Now as we spoke about earlier, the, the son had to carry the shell around the city and he had to go past all these different places, all these temptations that were around him, the smells, the sights, the woman calling him, the sounds of the clubs, the smell of the alcohol. He saw nothing. He didn't even know they even existed. All he was worried about was the shell because the shell had oil right to the brim of the, the shell. And if even one drop fell out of the shell, what was the order? The order was to chop his head off. And so what happened, he was worried. These guards were standing behind him with these big swords, and there he was walking with the shell throughout the city. And the sun was coming down, it was getting later and later and later. And he was sweating, like I said, his clothes were drenched. And as he saw the palace coming closer and closer and closer, he started moving towards it, he started to tremble. He almost fell at one point. He was so terrified that he wasn't going to make it. All his friends were amazed, like, what is wrong with this guy? Why didn't he just stop doing this? Do they really believe his father would kill him? And this boy really did believe his father would kill him because he knew that his father loved him and he had, his father had tried everything else. During the time that he had wandered around the city, during the time that he had gone from one place to the next in the city, he was thinking about all the things that his father had done for him, how his father had given him life, how his father had given him security, how his father had given him a place to stay, how his father had made sure all his needs were met. And he suddenly felt guilty for all those things that he had done wrong. And so when he managed to get to the front of the, the gates to where the palace was, he moved through the stairs, climbing the stairs slowly, holding the shell, making sure nothing was spilling. His legs were wobbling. And as he moved through the courtroom, the doors opened, and he walked through the courtroom, his father sat there in front of him. And he came in where the table was, he took the shell and he placed it on the table ever so gently. The son just stood there, broken, no energy, nothing, no wise cracks, nothing clever to say, just like a broken man. And everyone in the court was waiting for him to say something. He didn't say anything. And the father looked at the son and he says, how come you were able to go through all those temptations today? How come you didn't go to the clubs or the pubs or go womanizing? How come you weren't tempted by any of those things today? And the son looked down on the ground and he slowly looked up at the father and he said to the father, I have done so much wrong. I realize that if I have to just concentrate on the shell and the protection of the shell, that was all that was important to me, to protect the shell and to protect the oil inside it. Nothing else mattered. I didn't even know anything else mattered. All I wanted to do was protect what you had asked me to do. And I've come back and I've fulfilled this job. I've fulfilled my task. And the father said, I'm so proud of you. 
I am going to make you the future heir of this kingdom. Now, what can we learn from this story? It's a very intense story and it's a deep story. But we all carry a shell and we've all been given the shell to carry. And we have got to take this from our arrival when we were born until the day we die. That is our destination. We are carrying this precious oil, which is the Quran and the information that we are given from the Hadith. The Holy Quran is so precious that we cannot afford to drop a single drop of it. Now the gods that are behind us with the drawn swords, we know that this life that has been given to us is given to us free. It was given to us without any rental being paid on it. We don't get an electricity bill or power bill at the end of the month that says, listen, you got two eyes and a nose. You have to pay rent on that or you have to pay for that because we've only been hired out to you. The body was given to us for free. Everything that's in here is given to us for free. Our mind was given to us for free. We have all these things that are given to us for free. You see, we are going to answer for what we have done wrong. And so we must make sure that we carry the shell as if we do not want to drop one single drop. Now, every man is on the journey, like I said before. And everyone will be questioned on what he did on this journey. Will I arrive at the destination with my shell and oil intact? Will I have that consciousness that the way I've lived my life hasn't been pleasing to Allah? And that I need to make a change today. Today I need to start preparing for my departure and arrival. Today I need to, to become a, a person who is totally reformed. Now I, I had a, a brother in South Africa and he tells a, a story of a bird who had a head and two wings. This is a story that was narrated to me. And the head represents the love of God, the love of Allah, of this bird. And the bird, if it has no head, means you have no love for Allah. And the wings, the wings represent the mercy and hope that we have from Allah. And so if the bird does not have these two wings, we don't have the mercy and love from Allah. And if the bird doesn't have a head, then we don't have love for Allah. So the bird and the wings are representational. You see, the bird, the head is the love and the wings are the mercy. So some people just want the mercy and they don't want to, to love. We have to love the whole bird. The bird works so much better when it has head and two wings. And so the stronger the wings are, the better chance the bird has to reach its destination. If, if you think of a normal bird. If you see a bird outside and it has very weak wings, it's, it's not going to get very far. If you look at an ostrich, no matter how it, it flaps its wings, it's never going to be able to take off from the ground because um, wings are too weak. So the stronger the wings are, the stronger you have of reaching your final destination. And the higher it will be able to soar and the more it will be able to do, and the more acrobatics that bird will be able to do in the sky. And it's the same with us. If we take the mercy of Allah, if we take the mercy of Allah in this journey that we have, having righteous fear for Allah, fearing Allah because we know that we don't want to disappoint, knowing that we don't want to be displeasing to Allah. And if we take those wings and we exercise them like that bird does, we'll be able to soar to a much higher length, with much higher heights, and we will be less likely to be shot down by hunters you know, like that bird that's flying away and the hunter comes past and he tries to shoot that bird. If it hasn't got very strong wings and it's not very agile, it will be shot and it will come down. That's why you'll find most of the birds that are hunted by hunters are ones that are easy to catch. They don't have very good wings, they're not very strong, like pheasants and, and quails. They haven't got very strong wings and so they're easy to poach and easy to catch. So in our lives, we must make sure that, that the bird in our life, the, in, in the spiritual sense, that it has, has love for Allah that it has the strength to know where we're going, to have mercy and fear of God. That brings me to the next point that we need to look at, and that is the fear and hope in, in Allah. You see, many human beings carry on disobeying Allah and they carry on disobeying God and think that they can do whatever they want to do. And that they somehow will be saved from, from life's answerability. They won't be answerable for what they have done wrong. Like I said, it's very important that we love Allah and we don't just fear Him. But we must also realize that we do not wear bulletproof vests. And when we do something wrong and we provoke someone to pull a trigger, we're going to get hurt. So when we do sin and we partake in sin, we don't have a bulletproof vest from the punishment of Allah. How often do we hear people say, God is merciful, God is most forgiving, off forgiving, and people just think that they continue doing things without consequence. 
Now, you see, we have to realize that there are consequences for our actions. And so we must keep a balance. We must realize that Allah is merciful and oft forgiving, and He is compassionate and caring. But we also must realize that we don't wear a bulletproof vest, that we will re receive the punishment for the sins that we commit if we do not repent and we do not turn away from them, and we do not walk along the straight path. You see, the deception of, of the shaitan is to mislead as many of the slaves of, of Allah as possible. See, God is merciful, yes, and God is kind, yes, but He is also just. And the person who doesn't realize that lacks wisdom. So we need to be ready for this uh, final destination. We need to be ready for the day when we will have to answer for every action that we partook, every word that we said, every minute that we wasted. You know, some cell phone networks or mobile networks, they have what they call per second billing. It means every second that you're on your mobile phone, you get charged for, you're answerable for. Not for one minute or five minutes or generally how long you spent on the cell phone. Every second counts. And you know, that's something that we should write on our doors. Make every second count. Because you're answerable for every second. So we need to be sure that when we depart for the next world, when we leave this world, that we are sure of where we are going to be. We are sure that our account is going to be in favor of us and not against us. So we need to make sure that Every slave of Allah is a person or is a lady or a man or a young boy or a young girl who knows that Allah is off forgiving, most merciful, but that we will receive punishment for the sins that we have committed if we do not make right what we have done wrong. We need to go in true repentance and we need to make restitution. In other words, when we sin, we need to go and make right what we've done wrong. It's no use just saying, Allah, forgive me for what I've done wrong and not go make right what we have done wrong. It's very important that we make restitution. Restitution is simply that, make right what you've done wrong. So the most insignificant of sin in our eyes are probably the most significant sin in the eyes of Allah. Never think that that little sin that you have committed is not important. Because if you think it's insignificant, I guarantee that Allah does not see it insignificant. You see, little sins become big sins, and big sins become massive sins. And sin leads us away from Allah. So today, when we come towards the end of this program, I want you to think of one thing. Where are you going? Where are you at the moment? You've arrived and you're departing soon. Be prepared for the next world. Make every preparation. Make sure your passport is stamped. Make sure your visa is in place. Make sure your photographs are there. Make sure you protect that shell on the oil. And inshallah, one day we will all meet again and you'll be one amongst those who are called by Allah away from sin to doing what is right. Assalamu alaikum.